Hey, welcome to Northview. Welcome to all of our campuses, those watching online. And welcome to week one of Nothing But Net. Look at your neighbor and say, Nothing But Net. And hopefully you find that this is just a, a series that you can engage with and invite a friend to and uh, find that a church can be fun. Come on, wave at me if you think church can be fun, right? I'll uh, put a smile on your face and some momentum in your heart that when Jesus arrived on the scene, one of the first messages gone forward was the angel saying, hey, uh, joy to the world. So church ought to put a smile on your face. It's okay to laugh in church. And much of my heart behind a series like this is I'm often thinking, through the filter of God's desire uh, for us as a church to be a multi-generational church. Uh, it's a miss anytime one body of believers leans towards one generation over the other where we reach our full potential and where we really, uh, I think, accomplish the thing that God desires is when we see all generations represented uh, throughout the body of Christ. And I often will think at times when planning a series like this, how could I put out a series where we can tell the gospel in a way where a grandfather and his son and grandson would want to attend the service all together. And so that's really kind of the heartbeat behind this. If I'm thinking of myself as a grandfather with my son and grandchildren, uh, I'd want to go to church and experience this conversation. So that's kind of what's behind it. Nothing but net. It is a basketball series. It's March Madness. And we are in the Hoosier State. So some of them, folks, we, uh, I think we can get on board with it. And this is week three of doing it. And to just give you kind of the baseline as we jump into this, this idea of nothing but net uh, would find its foundation, I believe, in something the Apostle Paul said when he once said, uh, to live is Christ and to die is Gain. It's a big statement, but he's saying uh, when you give your life to Christ, what you discover is uh, you receive so much more in return that he is the true pr uh, prize and treasure and the ultimate reward. And when you give your life to Christ, some people sometimes will think in terms of sacrifice. Uh, but what you discover is if what you give is less than what you get, that's not a sacrifice. That's a profit. That's nothing but net, right? It, it's a net gain that your life or his life is a profit for you and I that we net gain uh, in our relationship with Christ is essentially the idea. And it's, it's, a, it's gonna be a fun series. And last year, we uh, did a deep dive into the life of Peter. And uh, this year, we're gonna look at an individual in scripture who I think you will be uh, drawn to as well. And so if you wanna open up your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 11, and I will say, I love the game of basketball. It's probably no news to you. And I would encourage you, hey, have fun with the series, wear a jersey, uh, put on some sneakers, and just have fun with the church over the next month. Uh, but when it comes to sports, uh, because of the achievement culture and competition and winning and losing and awards and trophies, uh, there is always the conversation of who is best, right? That's ultimately what a competition determines, who is best in this moment. And so when it comes to sports, there are always so many debates. And this is certainly the case with the game of basketball. And the debate oftentimes is who is the greatest of all time? Come on, wave at me if you've ever heard this debate. People talking about the game of basketball. Hey, who's the greatest? Or who would be on your Mount Rushmore of the, the game of basketball? Who do you think is the all-time greatest starting five? And for me... If I were to say, hey, these are my, I think, the top five individuals to ever pick up a basketball. These are the five greatest in my personal mind. And the first, I would say, is Magic Johnson. I think Magic Johnson is the greatest point guard uh, to ever play the game of basketball. 6'9", Michigan State, just a remarkable player who in the finals, uh, early on in his career, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar goes down and Magic goes from playing point guard to playing center, dominates and gets the championship. Uh, he is an icon and I believe uh, in the top five. In addition to that, I would put my man Bird uh, in the top five. Come on, Indiana. You gotta show some love to Bird. And, and anytime you get into the the debate about who's the greatest, the one thing that you have to acknowledge is it's not apples to apples. When you compare different eras to uh, different eras, they oftentimes don't line up. They're very different games in many ways. For example, Larry Bird came into the league at 1979. And what was also coming into the league at 1979? The three-point line. Right, the three-point line has become the new version of the dunk. People love to see you shoot from distance more than they like to see you jump high. And when Larry Bird first came into the league, the 
three-point line was just getting established. So early on in his career for the first three years, the average team in the NBA only shot two and a half three-point attempts a game. So in Larry Bird's entire career, he shot 1,725 threes in his entire career. Well, now you fast forward to today's game uh, where the greatest shooter to ever pick up a basketball now goes by the name of Stephen Curry. Yeah, and his team averages 40 three-point attempts a game from two and a half to 40. And in Curry's career, he still probably could play for another five years. He has already shot over 8,500 threes in his entire career. I'm like, man, if Bird played in today's NBA, he would be getting loose, right? Come on, Bird would be dominating. I think he's one of the greatest shooters ever. And I think it is Magic and Bird uh, who are responsible for March Madness. If you go through the history books and you really dive into the sport, what you find is it was this college rivalry, Michigan State, Indiana State, that made March Madness madness. And it ultimately carried over into the NBA where the Eastern Conference and the Western Conference were represented often by the Celtics and the Lakers. And it is a legendary rivalry. They're in my top two. In addition to that, I would put uh, the late, great Kobe Bryant in the top five. If you uh, do any research on Kobe and his uh, accomplishments, uh, it is uh, amazing uh, just to, to see what he did. In fact, he changed his number halfway through his career. He goes from uh, eight to 24. And if you look at what he did under each of those numbers, it's a Hall of Fame career as eight, and it's a Hall of Fame career as 24. The guy literally had two Hall of Fame careers. It's, it's amazing. And you got to be here for week three. Uh, I have a referee who's going to be joining me on the, ser uh, the, the, uh, for the services. And uh, he actually was a part of the Team USA Olympic run uh, with Kobe Bryant and LeBron. And he's got just uh, some amazing Kobe Bryant stories that you're going to want to hear. So that's week three uh, of this series. But Kobe is in my top three. Number four, I would put LeBron James. Which last night when I said this, I mean, it was crickets. And it was clear uh, LeBron's got some haters. And I've got to tell you, I do think you got to pay respect to where it's due. And I think in terms of body of work, there is a box score a mile long that is going to be untouched for decades. What, Michael, what LeBron James has done basketball-wise, statistically in terms of scoring, assists, rebounds, blocks, he's the all-around player. And he's one of the highest IQ basketball players to ever play the game. And last night, he eclipsed 40,000 points. That's, that's really amazing. The problem with LeBron, um, is the guy's been playing for over two decades now. So he's literally playing the grandchildren of some of the men he's played at when he first came in the league. <laughs> and uh, the older he's gotten, he's gotten a little whinier, uh, you know? And so now if you touch him, one of the biggest guys on the floor falls down. Uh, but uh, him and I were the same graduating class and I often look at him falling on the ground whining and I think, you know, at this age, if I started falling down that much, I'd be sore whining as well. Come on, wave at me if you see the beating. Like, I'll give him some grace. Uh, but I do think uh, you have to acknowledge uh, that he's one of the greatest, for without a doubt. And then lastly, the GOAT, the greatest of all time, come on, folks, is Michael Jordan. In fact, I would say that the, the debate about who's the GOAT is actually nonsense. Uh, you can talk about who is uh, maybe the top 10 of all time, uh, but the conversation regarding who is the greatest basketball player to ever play the game, uh, it's nonsense to even talk about anyone else other than Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan is just iconic. In fact, I would say this. I believe uh, Michael Jordan uh, is among only individuals like Muhammad Ali and Babe Ruth. I think he is in the category of the most iconic, uh, influential athletes in our nation's history. In fact, I would personally argue that I think Michael Jordan is the greatest athlete in American history. I, I just think what he has done for, for sports, in fact, in tw uh, 2021, uh, 2021, he was still voted the most popular athlete in America. And it had been almost 20 years since he played his last game. Uh, Michael Jordan was just outstanding and I think iconic and transcended the game of sports and still to this day a very relevant topic uh, around uh, sports and athletics. And my, my favorite moment of Michael Jordan's career is this shot right here. Now, this is the second 3 -peat. 
Michael Jordan three-peated twice, won six championships. And this is the second three-peat in Utah uh, who was favored to win the series. And this is Michael Jordan hitting the game-winning shot for the championship at the buzzard. I, I don't think it gets better than this, that if you want to create a fairy tale ending, it is the last shot we ever see Michael Jordan taking in a Bulls uniform is for the championship at the buzzard finals MVP. It, it doesn't get better than that. I would say in the game of basketball, personally, I think that's the greatest shot in basketball history. It's from the GOAT for the championship at the buzzard sunk game over Nothing but net. And it makes me think of scripture. If you were to have a similar debate, who is the greatest of all time? Now, obviously, the person in the room, Bible juking, uh, is going to say, well, Jesus is the greatest. Well, of course that, right? Let's set that aside. When you look at all of the individuals in scripture who are not God, who would you say is the greatest? And this is a fun debate because you can go through the pages of Scripture and like, oh my goodness, you got to put Abraham in the conversation. God comes to a man who had no frame of reference for a divine being and God says, hey, if you will go, I will show. And he steps out and he anchors his life to a promise. His wife is barren. He's promised to be a nation, a blessing to all. And he believes God. He trusts God. And God ushers in his redemptive plan through this man who raises up a family, who raises up a tribe, who becomes a nation. You gotta put Abraham in the conversation. Others would say, well, you gotta add Moses. He's the great first prophet in the Bible. I mean, he not only liberates the nation of uh, Israel out of slavery in Egypt, he not only squares off with Pharaoh and is the instrument of so many miracles, he is the conduit of God's initial word, his law and the commandments being imparted through him to the God, uh, people of God. So you have to put Moses in the conversation. In fact, you can look at Moses' contribution and scripture and the things that are written about him. He covers a great deal uh, of content in scripture. You can look at individuals like Elijah. I mean, the miracles and some would say, well, Elijah's one of the greatest prophets ever. Well, if you consider Elijah, you have to consider his protege, Elisha, who prayed, hey, I, I want a double portion of what Elijah had, and God grants it. So if you're thinking Elijah's in the top five, you for sure have to then include Elisha because he had a double portion. You could go on down the list and you could talk about Isaiah. He had his own book. Daniel, he had his own book. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Ruth. You could go down the list of, hey, Mary was pretty impressive herself. There's a whole list of who is the greatest. And what's amazing is when you go to the Bible, uh, Jesus actually sets the record straight. In fact, he says, hey, just so everyone knows, here is who I believe is the goat, the greatest of all time. In Matthew chapter 11, Verse 11, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, which pause, wave at me if you were born of a woman. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's amazing. This is a universal, flawless, perfect fact that every single one of us can relate to. We should keep that in mind. Among those born of a woman, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Whoa, uh, among in all those born of a woman, meaning Jesus like, let, just all of history, right? There is none greater than John the Baptist. He's saying the greatest of all time is John the Baptist. And this will immediately pique your interest. Well, wait a second, who is John? I wanna go home and open up the pages of scripture and read about John. What did he accomplish? Where did he do? Why does God look at his life compared to everyone else and think, now, he's the greatest. And what you should know is John is the last Old Testament prophet. Now, I know that'll cause some of you to scratch your head because you'll think to yourself, how is he the last Old Testament prophet when we read about him in the New Testament? What you find is all throughout history, God would raise up prophets. In fact, the greatest relay race in history is the word of God going forth throughout the prophets. And, and they, one after another, they, they extend the message and they relay it on and they pass the baton and God raises up over and over and over again prophets who would foretell and predict and articulate the promise of God and the coming Messiah. And 
John is the last runner in the relay race in which the prophets were ushering in the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And one way to think about it in terms of obviously Old Testament and New Testament, but maybe a better way to think about it in terms of biblical history is he is the last Old Covenant prophet. So there's Old Covenant, New Covenant. Jesus came fulfilling the law, ushering in a New Covenant to humanity. And so that is what you understand is John is the final leg in the world's greatest relay race. And when you ever, if you've ever been to a track meet, you know you always put your best leg last. And so that is certainly the case. But what you find is there's not a lot about John the Baptist. There's certainly not as much as Isaiah and Jeremiah and Elijah and Elisha. There's certainly not as much as Moses and Abraham. Those guys received entire books. And John gets a few chapters. And what you find is John is Jesus's cousin. It's an amazing story. You got to pay attention to it. You really owe it to yourself to read your own Bible. That moments before God would bring Jesus into the world, uh, he first brings John into the world. It's an amazing story that an angel of the Lord goes to a priest by the name of Zechariah, who is John's father. And he says, your wife, Elizabeth, is going to be pregnant, which she was barren, unable to have kids. And he has some doubts. How is this even possible? And God literally hits the mute button on Zechariah to where he's not able to speak for the entire pregnancy because of his doubts. Uh, I wonder if there's some women in the room who are like, does God still do that? Does he, does he still hit the mute button for the entire pregnancy? And what is amazing is as Elizabeth uh, becomes pregnant and begins to carry John, six months into her pregnancy, an angel of the Lord goes to Mary and says, hey, you who are highly favored, you know, blessed are you for, you know, you will conceive of a child and it'll be of the Holy Spirit. And it's this amazing Christmas narrative. And she too has some doubts. And she says, how is this even possible? And what does the angel say? Consider your cousin, Elizabeth. Consider your cousin who was said to be barren and unable to have kids. People thought that was impossible. And now she's six months pregnant. Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, and as she walks in the room, uh, John within her womb leaps. And it's this great confirmation moment of what God is doing in Mary and what God is doing in, in Elizabeth. And what is amazing is it is Elizabeth's testimony that gives strength, courage, and inspiration to Mary's situation. Now, I, I love that. Sometimes I think we don't take into consideration how God might use your testimony to impact somebody's life. That yeah, you're going through it, but God is faithful and God is good. And maybe, just maybe, somebody else needs to hear your story because they're going through something similar and you could be the source of hope and you could be the source of courage and you could be the source of confidence in the goodness of God in their life because testimonies are always better shared, right? So, John and Jesus, they, they grow up cousins, but Scripture doesn't tell us much about their upbringing, how much time they spent together. Did they spend much, if any, time together? What we know is moments before Jesus begins his public ministry, John begins his. In fact, John has a short public ministry. Most commentators would say that John uh, had a public ministry that lasted about six months before Jesus arrived on the scene. And John was a peculiar person. He was unique and uh, rough around the edges. He was honest, uh, but he was godly and he was bold. And God began to do amazing things in and through his life. And if you go to Matthew chapter three, all accounts of the gospel tell us about this moment. But I want to read it from Matthew chapter three. The entire chapter, so buckle up, folks. Verse one, it says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. So Isaiah prophesied that there would be a forerunner, someone who would prepare the way for the coming Messiah. And what Matthew is saying is John is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. And here was his prophecy. There will be a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, 
and make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. Wave at me if you got a leather belt around your waist today. Come on. Anyone rocking that John the Baptist? Yeah, it's a good look. <laughs> Keep that belt on. He goes on to tell us that his food was locusts and wild honey and people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw, I love this part, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers. I mean, he's not pulling any punches. He's not mentioning any words. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. He's saying, hey, your uh, profession of faith doesn't line up with the production of your life. There's a disdain in John for the deceitfulness and the self-righteousness and the hypocrisy uh, amongst these godly leaders, these religious elite. And he says, do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children. I love that statement. For Abraham and the ax is already at the root of the trees and Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Anyone getting uncomfortable? Here he goes. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear the threshing floor, gathering up his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And in this moment, it says, then Jesus came, verse 13, from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all the righteousness. If you want to study this week at home and you want to do a deeper dive in your devotional time, I would look at the perfect active obedience of Christ. I, I just think that would be a, a thing that you would want to look at. It's a great thing to uh, consider. It says in verse 16, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water and at that moment, Heaven was open. Now, if you go to other pages of scripture, like, you know, John's account, maybe Mark's account, it'll say heaven was torn open, which is amazing because the only other time that word torn is used is when Jesus is on the cross and the veil in the temple is torn. And the other time you'll find it is in Isaiah chapter 64, when Isaiah is saying, hey, there will come a moment where God will rip apart the skies and send in the chosen one. So it's, the imagery is so powerful. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. And this is, this is amazing. John is out at the Jordan River he is baptizing people for repentance. John is riding the coattails of a culture that is very accustomed with ceremonial cleansing. The baptism of John is not the same baptism that we practice today. We practice a baptism that says, hey, I'm going public acknowledging uh, my association and my identification uh, with the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. That is what baptism is today. John uh, lived on the side of history before Jesus died and resurrected from the grave for us to identify with. He lived on the side of history that was accustomed to ceremonial cleansing, and he goes out into the, the Jordan, out into the desert, and he's baptizing people for, again, repentance. And what you find is his message was like all the other prophets in Scripture. It was twofold. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. You go through all the pages of Scripture, it is a repent and believe function 
that the prophets would use. And the first word in John's message is repent. In fact, if you go through the, uh, the New Testament fun word study, you will find the word repent at the beginning of most sermons in the New Testament. And what is tragic is repentance has somehow gotten a bad rap within the church. There's such a poor misunderstanding and certainly a poor representation of repentance. Repentance is a beautiful thing, wonderful thing, catalytic thing in our relationship with Christ. And repentance is ultimately, it's pretty basic, the changing of mind and the turning away. Repentance is, hey, in this moment, something has altered my thinking, changed my mind. I'm realizing I was living for a lie. Now this is the truth. And aligning myself with this truth has me turning away from what I now see to be dishonoring to God, wickedness, wayward living. I am turning away from those things. And I think most people think uh, repentance is simply feeling bad. It's remorse. And repentance and remorse are not synonymous. Uh, remorse is uh, feeling bad in yourself. It's just feelings of guilt and shame and self-loathing. But repentance is seeing bad character in yourself. It's like, no, it's just like, I, I just see where God wants to improve my character. I see the, the potential in my life that God has drawn my attention to. Where remorse is feeling bad because you broke God's rules, repentance is feeling bad because you broke God's heart. Remorse is tied to rules. Repentance is tied to relationship. Hey, I have this relationship with my heavenly father and because of the way in which I'm thinking and approaching my life, uh, it is breaking the heart of my heavenly father. And it is the, the turning uh, away. And for some of you, um, you need to repent for the first time. You're not a Christian and you're here today. And for you, it's again, simple, repent and believe. Uh, repent that you are a sinner, fractured in soul, in need of a, a savior. And his name is Jesus Christ. And when you believe in him and put your faith in the, the finished work of the cross, that's salvation. For some of you, you need to repent for the first time. Others of you, you need to repent for the next time. That repentance is not a one-time thing. You don't just repent when you come to Christ. Repentance is a lifestyle. It is a, uh, a posture. It is a mindset. It is every single day I live at the foot of the cross. Every single day I live aware of my need for Jesus. And every single day I am blessed and graced by his willingness to enlighten me, to give me wisdom, to convict me, to make me aware of the things in which I am participating in that run against the grain of his will or forfeit my full potential. That is ultimately what you have. And John is saying, hey, repent and believe. And what is he saying believe? The kingdom of heaven is near. That's what you should believe. That's what he's saying. He's like, guys, the king is on his way. I mean, the march is making their way in. It's about to begin. And here's where most people misread John. They think John is saying, get ready, the end is near. They think John is saying, hey, don't mess up. When in all reality, John is saying, get ready, the beginning is here. And John is not so much saying, don't mess up. He's saying, don't miss out. That Jesus is gonna show up, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the savior of all things, and he is going to divide history. The arrival of this king will leave human history forever changed. And whether you're, not, you're a Christian or not, that is the case. Nobody can deny the meteoric impact of the arrival of Christ. He shook the foundations of our world still to this day. See, this is where people get it wrong. They think you can come to Christ and walk away neutral. And no, you can't. You can't come to Christ and, and just walk away neutral. He's either God or he is a maniac cult leader who duped all of us. 
If he's not God, he's not a good man. Do you understand that? If he's not God, folks, he tricked all of us, and what are we doing right now? It's a weird thing to think about. You can't come to Christ and walk away neutral. He's either God or he's not. And what I love about this passage is this is a hard one for the critics. Anyone run into a critic of your faith? Oh, just learn to enjoy it. It's an opportunity for you to tell somebody about Jesus, right? Their questions are your platform. And I, I love this because here's where most critics aim in their critique of our faith in the scriptures, is they will affirm Jesus as man, which again, we've already established, he's just not a good man or teacher. They will affirm him as a man, but they will dismiss anything that hints of his deity and him being God. So anything in scripture that makes Jesus more, are you paying attention? Anything that makes him more, they dismiss. Anything more than a man, they work to discredit. Well, here's the problem with this passage. This trips up critics because this doesn't make him more. It makes him less. Pay attention. So John is on the, the riverbanks. He's baptizing people for repentance. And Jesus walks up and says, you baptize me. And what does John say? That doesn't make any sense. Why would I baptize you? I'm out here baptizing for repentance and for the cleansing of sin. You've never sinned. You're not broken. You don't have to repent. The rest of us do. So in this moment, this doesn't make Jesus more. It makes him less. And here's what is so fascinating, breathtaking, just life altering and mesmerizing about Christ is he has this simultaneous nature and this ability to make brilliant exchanges, profound exchanges, that he is constantly stepping into your shoes so you could step into his. And he takes our brokenness and gives us his righteousness. He takes our shame and gives us his grace. He takes on our death and gives us his life. It's this great reversal all throughout the pages of scripture. It's him saying, hey, I'll take your place. You get mine. This is a beautiful thing. It makes him less, that Jesus becomes less also that you and I could become more. <laughs> Folks, it's amazing. Thanks, Fred. Like, you and me are gonna grab coffee. <laughs> he makes us more. That God has more in store for you. And so John is saying, don't miss out. The kingdom is coming. It has arrived and God is about to usher into the world uh, a move of love and redemption that will leave the world forever changed. And... He baptizes Jesus. And I think, personally, this is my own personal opinion. You can dismiss it or disagree with it. That's fine. But the moment when Jesus comes up out of the water, I think this is the greatest shot in the Bible. It's amazing. When Jesus comes out of the water, what does it tell us? It says the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove, not as a dove. Let's make that clear because now we have all this Christian imagery that we think the Holy Spirit is a dove. Like a dove. One commentator said uh, the dove was viewed in ancient times as the general of the birds. That there was an elegance and a prestige and a composure and there was a gentleness and a peace to a dove and he was the general of the birds. And scripture says that in that moment, the, the general of the sky descended upon the son of God emerging from the water. And simultaneously, God the father rips open the heavens. And he says, this is my son, whom I love, whom I'm well pleased. Now, understand this. This is, the only, this is only the second time in the entire Bible that you have the full Trinity on display in the same scene. Oh, it's amazing. 
Every single time throughout history, you find one member of the Trinity taking center stage, but twice in the Bible, the Holy Trinity stands center stage together. In this moment, you have the Trinity on center stage. Where's the other time you see it? In creation. God is creating all things, the heavens and the earth, and it comes to humanity and they say, let us make humanity in our image and likeliness. The last time these three were together on the scene, they created new life. Oh, there, there's such an echo here. So what happens is, is the three of them show up on the scene and once again, here is God on full display, all three members of the Trinity, and they are starting to create new life for humanity. And what's beautiful about it is what does Jesus do the moment he's baptized? Come on, you guys, you gotta go home and read your Bible. If you go to Matthew chapter four, the very next verse, verse one, I don't have it on the screen. It says, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. This is amazing. Because again, if you go to the story of creation, what happens? The Holy Trinity on display, they create humanity. And then what happens? The devil shows up and he tempts Adam and Eve and they fall and sin enters the world, sin and death. Jesus shows up on the scene once again. It's this echo of creation. Jesus comes up out of the water and right off the bat, he's like, let's set the record straight. Where's that stupid serpent? <laughs> and he marches out into the wilderness and he shows down with the serpent and where the first Adam failed, the second Adam succeeded. This is the book of Romans. The book of Romans refers to Christ as the second Adam. Yeah, the first Adam ushered in death. Oh, man. But the second Adam ushered in life. And, and here's what's amazing. Who do you pay attention to in the moment? You can't take in this shot all at once. You either have to take a moment to stare at the perfect obedience of the Son. The humility, the gentleness, the mercy, the compassion, the commitment to grace, the commitment to the cross, and the beginning of his public ministry. You are either captivated by the Son, or you have to turn this way, and you are captivated by the general of heaven descending upon him, and power, and the same power that would eventually raise him from the dead coming into the scene. Or your soul trembles at the voice of the Father, as the light shines down upon Christ, it's hard to take it all in at once. And in the middle of it all, is <laughs> John just holding Jesus. <laughs> Come on, you've participated in a baptism. Like there's a whole follow through to this thing, right? You gotta slay that thing. And John is holding the savior of the world. And the full Trinity is on display. And as the sun comes up out of the water and is looking to the heavens, the father says, that's my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And in that moment, John catches a gaze from the father. Oh, man. You talk to any therapist, any psychologist, any counselor, any philosopher, you will find that most people unanimously agree that much of the world is walking around with father wounds. Most people are marked, guided, shaped, governed by a wound from their father. It is a profound thing. Again, go home, do your own research. There is something about the role of a father in every single one of our lives that marks us forever. And they say, scientifically, all the research, there are four things we all need from a father. Protection, provision, presence, and praise. And there's a whole spectrum to this. Some of you were marked by a father who was completely absent. And you lived much of your life running from that version of fatherhood and manhood. And you were marked by a wound from an absent father. Maybe some of you, your dad wasn't 
a protector. Maybe he wasn't a provider. Maybe you never heard any praise from the mouth of your father. Hey, good job. I'm proud of you. So many people are marked with a father wound. And in this moment, (laughs) you have Jesus becoming less, trading our place, and saying, hey, I'll take on your reality so you can take on mine. You can have my relationship with my father. And because of what I'm going to do for you, every single one of you can be adopted into the family of God. I will become less so you can become more. So you don't have to live the rest of your life marked by a father wound because your perfect, faithful, and good father in heaven says, this is my son, this is my daughter with whom I love and I am well pleased. It's outstanding. I close with this. If you go back to Matthew 11, I only read the first part of the verse to you. I read 11a. Let's read it in its entirety. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet, semicolon, he who is least in the kingdom of heavens is greater than he. Jesus is like, listen, that guy there is the goat. But everyone who places their faith in the finished work of the cross, everyone who becomes an heir to the kingdom, everybody who becomes a child of God is greater than him. I will become less so you can become more. And you give your life to Christ and you discover, oh my goodness, it truly is nothing but net. Amen.